Ahangvante, Tisaranena, Saha, Pancha, Sil, Silani, Yachami. Dutiampi, Ahangvante, Tisaranena, Saha, Pancha, Silani, Yachami. Dutiampi, Ahangvante, Tisaranena, Saha, Pancha, Silani, Yachami. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa. 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 Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambudhasa. Buddhang saranang gachami. Buddhang saranang gachami. Dhammang saranang gachami. Dhammang saranang gachami. Sanghang saranang gachami. Sanghang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi buddhang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi buddhang saranang kachami. Dutiyampi dhammang saranang kachami. Dutiyampi dhammang saranang kachami. Dutiyampi sanghang saranang kachami. Dutiyampi sanghang saranang kachami. Dutiyampi buddhang saranang kachami. Tatiyampi buddhang saranang kachami. Tatiyampi dhammang saranang kachami. Tatiyampi dhammang saranang kachami. Tatiyampi sanghang saranang kachami. Tatiyampi sanghang saranang kachami. Ti saranagamanang ititang. Amabante. Pāna tipāta vairamani sikha padang samādhiyam. Pāna tipāta vairamani sikha padang samādhiyam. Adinna dāna vairamani sikha padang samādhiyam. Adinna dāna vairamani sikha padang samādhiyam. Kāme su michātāra. Vairamani Sikha Padang Samadhyam. Kami Sumitra Chara. Vairamani Sikha Padang Samadhyam. Musavada Vairamani Sikha Padang Samadhyam. Musavada Vairamani Sikha Padang Samadhyam. Surami Raya Majapamadakthana. Vairamani Sikha Padang Samadhyam. Surami Raya Madja Pamadathana. Vairamani Sikha Padang Samadhyam. Imani Pancha Sikha Padani. Silena Sugatingyanti. Silena Boga Sampada. Silena Nibutingyanti. Tasma Silang Visodha Yeng. Sadhu, Sadhu. Sadhu, 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 Sadhu. 77. In the description of hinting, Nemitikata, a sign, Nimitta, is any bodily or verbal act that gets others to give requisites. Giving a sign is making a sign such as, what have you got to eat, etc., on seeing people going along with food. Indication is talk that alludes to requisites. Giving indication. On seeing cowboys, he asks, Are these milk cows calves or buttermilk cows calves? And when it is said, They are milk cows calves, venerable sir, he remarks, They are not milk cows calves. If they were milk cows calves, the bhikkhus would be getting milk, etc., and he's getting it to the knowledge of the boy's parents in this way, and so making them give milk is giving indication. I think cowboy um, isn't, um, isn't how we normally understand the word cowboy. On seeing uh, boys that herd cows, 
So they're actually young boys, I think. In indirect talk is talk that keeps near to the subject. And here there should be told the story of the bhikkhu supported by a family. A bhikkhu, it seems, who was supported by a family, went into the house wanting to eat and sat down. The mistress of the house was unwilling to give. On seeing him, she said, there is no rice. And she went to the neighbor's house as though to get rice. The bhikkhu went into the storeroom, looking around. He saw sugar cane in the corner behind the door, sugar in a bowl, a string of salt fish in a basket, rice in a jar, and ghee in a pot. He came out and sat down. When the housewife came back, she said, I did not get any rice. The bhikkhu said, lay follower. I saw a sign just now that alms will not be easy to get today. What, venerable sir? I saw a snake that was like sugar cane put in the corner behind the door. Looking for something to hit it with, I saw a stone like a lump of sugar in a bowl. When the snake had been hit with the clod, it spread out a hood like a sh string of salt fish in a basket, and its teeth, as it tried to bite the clod, were like rice grains in a jar, and the saliva mixed with poison that came out to its mouth in its fury was like ghee in a pot. She thought, there is no hoodwinking the shaveling, so she gave him the sugar cane, and she cooked the rice and gave it all to him with the ghee, the sugar, and the fish. Such talk that keeps near to the subject should be understand, understood as indirect talk. Roundabout talk is talking round and round the subject as much as is allowed. In the description of belittling, Abusing is abusing by means of the ten instances of abuse. Disparaging is contemptuous talk. Reproaching is enumeration of faults such as he is faithless, he is an unbeliever. Snubbing is taking up verbally thus. Don't say that here. Snubbing in all ways, giving grounds and reason, is continual snubbing. Or alternatively, when someone does not give, taking him up thus, oh, the prince of givers is snubbing, and the thorough snubbing thus, a mighty prince of givers is continual snubbing. Ridicule is making fun of someone thus. What sort of life is this man who eats up all his seed? In parentheses, grain. Continual ridicule is making fun of him more thoroughly thus. What? You say this man is not a giver who always gives the words there is nothing to everyone? Denigration is denigrating someone by saying that he is not a giver or by censoring him. All around denigration is continual denigration. Hail bearing is bearing tales from house to house, from village to village from district to district, thinking, so they will give me out of fear of my bearing tales. Backbiting is speaking censoriously behind another's back after speaking kindly to his face. For this is like biting the flesh of another's back when he is not looking, on the part of one who is unable to look him in the face. Therefore it is called backbiting. This is called belittling, nipesikata because it scrapes off nipesity, wipes off the virtuous qualities of others as a bamboo scraper, velupesika, thus unguent, or because it is a pursuit of gain by grinding, leaping situa, and pulverizing others' virtuous qualities, like the pursuit of perfume by grinding perfume substances. That is why it is called belittling. The description of pursuing gain with gain, pursuing in hunting after, got from here is got from this house. There is into that house. Seeking is wanting. Seeking for is hunting after. Seeking out is hunting after again and again. The story of the bhikkhu who went round giving away the alms he had got at first to children of families, 
here and there, and in the end, got milk and gruel should be told here. Searching, etc., are synonymous for seeking, etc. And so the construction here should be understood thus. Going in search of is seeking. Searching for is seeking for. Searching out is seeking out. This is the meaning of scheming and so on. So a lot of these little descriptions of this means this and that means that is much more meaningful when you read the Pali. But it, it's sort of the way of the commentary to try and explain the word with words that are a little more familiar. So it, it's not all that interesting unless you're a scholar of these things. So don't try and, if, if you're confused about what this is all about, well, we can just sort of, you don't have to pay too much attention to these little, like we'll read them, but don't worry too much about it. It's it's just part of the text to make it very clear what the words mean. Saying this word means this word, a word that is maybe more familiar. It's like a dictionary where you try to define some words by other words. Now, as regards the words, the evil states beginning with, here the words beginning with, to be understood, to include the many evil states given in the Brahmajala Sutta, in the way beginning. Or, just as some worthy aesthetics, while eating the food given by the faithful, make a living by raw livelihood, by such low arts as these, that is to say, by palmistry, by fortune telling, by dividing omens, by interpreting dreams, marks on the body, holes gone by mice, by fire sacrifice, by spawn oblation. I don't understand this DI9 reference. It's the Diga Nikaya, the first book. Uh, I think he gives most of the, this was translated a long time ago, and he gives most uh, of the references from the Pali Text Society, which Sometimes they're not very easy for us to find exactly, but D1 means just the first book of the Diga Nikaya, the ninth page, probably. In the previous uh, paragraph, it was mentioned about a bhikkhu who was giving away his uh, alms to the children. Why is that so bad? Well, what when he gives it away, he ingratiates himself. He gives away this sort of coarse food that he got to the children. And the parents say, oh, this monk is such a great monk. And they end up giving him more food, better food because of their attachment oh. to him. I mean, a modern thing is if monks are too attached, you know, too ingratiating themselves with, with kids, like they'll give toys to kids or that sort of thing, or give candies to, to the kids. And then the parents will give money to the monastery because of how uh, well the, the monk t treats the kids. Mm. That's a com that's something I've seen before. And it's mm -hmm. not terrible, but it well, it's not perfect. It's like one of the uh, finer details to work out. Not not the biggest problem, yeah. but you know, when you're smoothing out all the wrinkles, that's what one of the, the finer ones to to smooth out. Well, the problem is twofold. It um it keeps the monks from focusing on fewness of wishes, right? Because mm -hmm. they're always potentially scheming. And it also corrupts the lay people. So then when monks don't give the kids candy and so on, or babysit their mm -hmm. kids or whatever, they, mm -hmm. they think, who is this monk who isn't, isn't, doesn't, isn't kind to our kids and that sort of thing. So it's hard yes. for meditating monks who are dedicated to meditation to even survive because all the lay people are corrupt and they think monks should babysit their kids and that sort of thing. I mean, uh, using your arms food to gain better things like giving away just to get something better it feels to be like strong defilement not one of the finer defilement especially if uh, if somebody intentionally does that i can see when monks are uh, giving to children without the intention of uh, getting anything back uh, that wouldn't be a problem but uh, if the monk has the intention to get something back then that would be a real problem yeah, for example, if kids are, if there are young orphans staying in the monastery, then the monks can support the orphans. But monks have to be pretty careful about that because it may seem innocent, but the question is, why are the monks doing that? And how is it going to be perceived when the monks are giving gifts to the lay people, even the children? How are the children going to think of the monks? 
it, it creates a culture that I don't think is really the best where there's a sort of a familiarity and an expectation on both sides and that sort of thing. I'm reminded of an article that I read pretty recently about uh, here in Thailand during the COVID-19 pandemic. Some temples had, uh, the article gave the stance that they had flip-flopped the relationship and the monastics were cooking and preparing food for lay people in need. I wonder if this would uh, run afoul of what we're reading here, seeking out. I think there's better ways to do it than having the, monk, the monks cook. Like I think monasteries as organizations, like take our organization, for example, our organization could have a monastery and uh, the organization of lay people could organize such a thing if there was a famine or if we were in a position to do that without the monks having to get involved. The problem is, I mean, it, it relates to things like how monks use money and therefore don't rely on and have a, the right relation or a good relationship with the lay community. In other words, the lay community doesn't do anything. The monks do everything because they have money and they have power and so on. And so they don't have this kind of setup that we have. I mean, uh, maybe some of them do, but not like this. Many of them are, are run by monks and monks. You, you can see even here, here at the monastery we're at, it's monks are in charge of many things that lay people might otherwise be in charge of if the lay people were involved in the monastery. 84. So this wrong livelihood entails the transgression of the six training precepts announced on account of uh, livelihood. And it entails the evil state of beginning with scheming, talling, talking, hunting, belittling, pursuing gain with gain. And so it is the uh, abstinence from all sort of wrong livelihood that is virtue of livelihood, purification. The word meaning of uh, which is this on account of it, the um, live that it is a uh, livelihood. What is it? It is the effort consisting in the search for requisites. Purification is purifiedness. Livelihood purification is purification of livelihood. As regards the next kind called virtue concerning requisites, here is a text. Reflecting wisely, he uses a robe only for protection from cold, for protection from heat, for protection from contact with gadflies, flies, wind, burning and creeping things, and only for the purpose of concealing the private parts. Reflecting wisely, he uses arms, foods, neither for amusement, nor for intoxication, nor for smartening, nor for embellishment, but only for the endurance and continuance of the body, for the ending of discomfort, and for assisting the life of purity. Thus, I shall put a stop to old feelings and shall not arouse new feelings, and I shall be healthy and blameless and live on comfort. Reflecting wisely, he used the resting place only for the purpose of protection from cold, for protection from heat, for protection from contact with gadflies, flies, wind, burning and creeping things, and only for the purpose of warding off the perils of climate and enjoying retreat. Reflecting wisely, he used the requisite of medicine as cure for the sick only for protection from arising hot feelings and for complete immunity from affliction. Herein reflecting wisely, he is reflecting as the means and as a way. By knowing, by reviewing is the meaning. And here in the reviewing stated in the way beginning. For protection from cold, that should be understood as reflecting wisely. So this paragraph is from the Buddhist teaching. So he's just quoting the Buddhist teaching. This is a reflection that we do in uh, morning and evening chanting. Mahasi Sayada talks about it in one of his books, sort of the debate about whether you have to do that chant every day. And, and he says, well, you know, actually the chant is just an example. It's not the chant that's important. What's important is that you actually do reflect wisely when you use these things. But this is, this is well known by most monks. We chant the Patisankha Yoni So Chivarang. 
the uh, Cambodian, and I can't remember if the Sri Lankans do as well, but the Cambodians do yata pachayam pavatamanang datu matamewe tang yati tang chivarang. So they do something where they reflect on it as, actually the Thais do it as well, never mind. Uh, where they reflect on the requisites as just the elements. I wonder if that's in here somewhere. I don't know if later it's going to talk about that, but there's three ways of reflecting. The first one is this that you read here. The second one is reflecting on them as just elements. Like the robe that I use is just the four elements, just feelings and like sensations of, of, of the robe that I feel. And the person who uses it is also just the four elements the five with consciousness. And the third way of reflecting is reflecting in terms of the loathsomeness, the impurity, that this robe was clean when I got it, but every time I put it on the body, it gets it gets disgusting from the body. And this body is also disgusting. Sweat and smelly, and you have to keep washing it. And with food as well, food is so beautiful, but then you put it in your mouth and it gets all sticky and grimy and mashed up into paste. The idea behind this is here, he's going to talk about it, but the reason for this is to free you from the attachment to these things, help you have a good perspective on what they actually are, that they're not actually something that you should crave for or obsess about, use them for what they're supposed to be used, what they're important to be used for. I was just going to ask what it means by the, the word smartening when it says neither for amusement nor intoxication nor smartening. Fattening, I think, is it, or for bulking up, that's what that means. I wanted to say that later on it will go more into detail about the food, how one should look at food. And I was just want to say that I found that part to be very interesting, but I think that it will take a while until we get there. The meditation on food? I think that just to look at like the stomach as as a bowl that never gets washed and something like that. Uh -huh. Yeah, there's a whole meditation on it in the samadhi section. I was just uh, going to ask if reflecting wisely could also mean that maybe reflecting with metta and just being very uh, grateful for the food and where it comes from. That's not considered no. reflecting wisely. Oh, okay. Oh, that's the sort of thing that could still encourage greed. You're grateful for it, so you, you like it more and more. But as you say, oh, I'm so grateful these people gave me good food. Gratitude is important, yes, but that's not considered reflecting wisely. I'm wondering where did I learn it from then to think uh, about? It's a common sort of pop Buddhist, or it's a, it's a pleasing sort of teaching to think about where the food came from and, and so on. But really, for a, especially for a monk, the way you show gratitude is by practicing well. And that's, that's why the, de the dedication in this example is on using the food just for its purpose and having a, a mind that is free from attachment to it. That's what shows great gratitude. It would be ungrateful to be playful with the food and so on. These people give it, the best reason for giving it is out of confidence that the monks are practicing well. And and even if there is no no such idea as that, it's a teaching. So if the lay people think, oh, I'll give it, and this often is the case where lay people give food, thinking, oh, the monk will like this, this will be delicious. I went to, recently went to one of my lay followers' houses, and they gave like three or four dishes of food, and I just put it all together in one bowl. And <laughs> they were, you can't put it together, it's different tastes. I said, well, this is how monks do it. I mean, it's a, it's a simple thing, right? But it's a bit of a teaching to help them appreciate the right way of practice. It's funny that the lay people sometimes, or I don't know how often, give like sweets and things that are really unhealthy. <laughs> There's several reasons. I mean, one reason is just it's become cultural to give the best. Uh, I mean, it's it's mainly here in, in Thailand. Sri Lanka is not really that bad. Sri Lanka gives a lot more healthy food, I think. But in Thailand, you give the best and the most delicious. It's all about taste because the taste is a cultural, culturally important thing. Well, to some extent, it's something that makes for good teachings, reminding Thai meditators not to be so attached to taste. I think one thing is putting an effort to give the 
best is uh, more awesome, I think, uh, compared to just being careless and just giving. Yeah, sorry, I, I didn't quite mean that. They give the most expensive, which is often meat, but it's not very good. It's not healthy at all. Like they give a lot of pork and like um, packaged uh, sweets and stuff that are expensive, but very, very unhealthy. There's no reason to, there's no good reason to eat them at all. Well, unless you're starving and, and need the sugar, but even then it's kind of poisonous. Bhante, you don't take it as an obligation that you have to make use of everything that's offered to you? No, you don't have to make use of everything that's offered to you. You don't have to accept it. I mean, one issue we have is that we accept too much. Alms is a bit complicated because of how the food is in bags. It's not mixed in the bowl. But, you know, luckily we, we, we have a large community here and we can give most of it away. But even even if you get excess food and you don't eat it all, there's no there's no problem with throwing it away. As long as you do it where there's no beings that will die from throwing it. You have to check and see, make sure there's no ants you're d dumping it on. I was just going to add something to what um, Edit was saying about the, the reflecting with meta on the requisites. I I know there's a section in uh, Manual Binsight where Mahasi Sayadaw talks about if a bhikkhu practices meta towards his, his donors, it uh, purifies the use of requisites, even if he didn't properly consider their use at the time of using them. Um, that's on uh, page 41 of a uh, manual of insight that has the details. Meta towards the donors, that purifies it. That's a surprise. I only learned from Mahasi probably that's correct. It's where I picked it up. I mean, it very well may be. I'm, I'm a little bit suspicious, though. I wonder, because I remember having one translation of a Mahasi book where I found out that the translation was wrong. And I and, and many long-term, long-time Mahasi followers had been following this book, and I couldn't understand how this book could be saying that. And it turns mm -hmm. out it was just mistranslated. Someone just added their own idea to it. Yep, I, I can I can put that section in. That page, I think it's two or three pages that explains. I, I can put that in the, the chat for later. Yep, it is the Manual of Insight from a Wisdom publication. Um, I'll, 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 post, I'll post the details in chat for that, with yeah. which edition of the translation and so yeah. forth. It may very well be accurate, but I'm starting to get a bit suspicious. Okay. Because that, huh? mm -hmm. that's not what he says in another book. I mean, it's not he it's not what the commentaries say is I mean maybe it is, but I've never heard that before. Anyway, yeah. it's fine. I mean obviously having meta towards the donors is a grateful a gratitude sort of thing, but I'm not sure how that purifies the use of requisites. Having metta Bhante is not necessarily feeling gratitude, right? Just wishing well to people. Uh, so the practice of metta can be considered a meditation practice, and because yeah. you're practicing meditation you are a good monk, and therefore it relates to how you deserve the requisites because you're practicing. But I don't think that's relating to the purification of requisites. I mean, we should read the Visuddhimagga, what it says, if it says anything about that. But in a way, it's still superior to be mindful during eating the food, not afterwards or before that, to practice metta. Yeah, that's what he says in one of his other books, how, how being mindful, because then you see it only as the elements. So you don't actually ever have to reflect, you just be mindful as you eat. And because you see it as the elements, that's considered purification. Metta while you're eating? I guess so. I think there was a story of a monk who practiced metta meditation all the time. Because of that, mm -hmm. wherever the monk stayed, there were no quarrels, no wars, or no conflicts wherever he went. Because of he was so developed in metta, wherever he went, he was just practicing metta. Here in the robe is one any of those beginning with the inner cloth. He uses, he employs, dresses in as inner cloth, or puts on as upper garment. Only is a phrase signifying invariability in the definition of a limit, of a purpose. The purpose in the meditators making use of the robes is that much only, namely protection from cold, etc. Not more than that. 
from cold, from any kind of cold arisen either through disturbance of elements internally or through change in temperature externally for protection, for the use, for the purpose of warding off, for the purpose of eliminating it so that it may not arouse affliction in the body. For when the body is afflicted by cold, the distracted mind cannot be wisely exerted. That is why the Blessed One permitted the rope to be used for protection from cold. So in each instance, except that from heat means from the heat of fire, the origin of which should be understood as forest fires, and so on. From contact with gadflies and flies, wind and burning and creeping things, here gadflies are flies that bite. They are also called blind flies. Flies are just flies. Wind is distinguished as that with dust and that without dust. Burning is burning of the sun. Creeping things are any long creatures, such as snakes and so on, that move by crawling. Contact with them is of two kinds, contact by being bitten and contact by being touched. And that does not worry him who sits with a robe on. So he uses it for the purpose of protection from such things. Only the word is uh, repeated in order to define a subdivision of invariable purpose. For the concealment of the private part is an invariable purpose. The others are purposes periodically. Herein, private parts are any parts of the utentum for when a member is disclosed, conscious hiri is disturbed, kupati, offended. It is called private parts, hirikopina, because of the disturbance of conscious hirikopana for the purpose of concealing the private parts, for the purpose of concealment of those private parts, as well as the reading hiriko pina paticca dan danatam. There is a reading hiriko pina paticca danatam. Alms food is any sort of food, for any sort of nutriment is called alms food. Pindapata, literally meaning lump dropping, because of its having been dropped. Patitata, into a bhikkhu's bowl during his alms round. Pindolia, or alms food. Pindapata, is the dropping, pata, of the lumps. Pinda, it is the concurrence, sanipata, the collection of alms. Bhikkhu obtained here and there is what is meant neither for amusement neither for the purpose of amusement as with village boys etc for the sake of sport is what is meant nor for intoxication not for the purpose of intoxication as with boxers etc for the sake of intoxication with strength and for the sake of intoxication with manhood is what is meant, nor for smartening, not for the purpose of smartening, as with royal concubines, partisans, etc., for the sake of plumpness in all the limbs, is what is meant, nor for embellishment, not for the purpose of embellishment, as with actors, dancers, etc., for the sake of a clear skin and complexion, is what is meant. What does uh, lump the pindapata would mean like you're not aiming for a good food or healthy food or anything like that. It's just what what is like dumped on you. No lumps are. It's what the what the word literally means. Pindapata, dropping of lumps, as people drop lumps of rice and you know, spoonfuls of rice or spoonfuls of of beans or that sort of thing. 
I saw it, Bhante, that I'd heard people refer to the alms round as Pindapata, but here I see it's Pindolia. Uh, I don't think I've ever heard anyone say Pindolia before, or even seen a Pali word that ends with ya like that. Here in Thailand, I've heard yeah. it called Bat. Pindolia comes from Pindola. Pindolia. Hmm. It is rare. I don't know if I've ever seen a L and a Y together. But it means going for, it's the going for alms, or it's the asking for alms. I think ya, the root ya is to ask, or in regards to asking, maybe that's what it is, asking for alms. It's probably a very old word, like begging, just a colloquial word. Thank you, Bhante. Bhante, now I remember a Dhammapada story where a monk told a person that uh, they could, uh, it's out of context a bit now, but they could throw, if they want to throw away their food, because they were somewhere around behind the house where he was walking by. And if the person wants to throw away the food, they can throw it away in his bowl. And is that mm -hmm. allowed? That sounds like hinting, I think. Or is that okay? Well, considering they're throwing it away, it's not hinting of, after anything that is of value to the people. So monks are allowed to take garbage. It's an interesting case, but it seems reasonable. I mean, he's what he's saying is logical. If you're going to throw that away, that means you don't want it. So it's not, I'm not taking anything from you. Just put it in my bowl. You I remember eat. sitting in front of a, a pizza shop in downtown Toronto. I had walked in downtown Toronto for alms and got nothing. I met a, a Cambodian man who asked me what I was doing. And I said, uh, I'm going on Oh, no he, he, no, he started talking to me and he said, oh, you're a monk. And he said, yeah, I'm Buddhist too. And he started saying how great Buddhism was. And then he said, and then we talked for, he just kept saying, how, talking how great it was. And then he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm going on alms round. And he suddenly just froze up and turned around and walked away. Nobody was interested in giving me food at all. And then I went and sat down kind of tired and just happened to be in front of a pizza shop. And this this young woman came up and started talking to me. And uh, she said, yeah, I'm, uh, she said, yeah, I don't have any food either. And we we're just talking for a bit. And then she saw behind us, uh, the guy from the pizza shop was throwing away some burnt pizzas or some burnt pizza slices or something. And he said, are you going to throw those away? We'll take them. <laughs> and and, he's, and he, he looked at us and he said, you want some pizza? And he, he threw the stuff away, but he said, you want some pizza? Come come in, I'll give you some pizza. And he ended up giving both of us a big slice of pizza and a, a can of soda as well, I think. Really nice guy. I think uh, that's what Venerable Rattapala did when he visited the parents' house. Yeah. The slave girl was throwing away on the old porridge or something. And then he asked uh, whether she's going to throw it away. Then she said, yes. Then he said, if you're going to throw it away, it's put it into my bowl. Regarding the question about the word Pindola, I think there was a monk named Pindola Bharadwaja. Well, that's Pindola. This is Pindola. Yeah. Pindola is the alms. Pindola means alms. Pindola means asking for alms. The alms round. Could you knock on people's doors if no one is around, if no one knows that you're going to alms? No, you can't knock on someone's door. You can stop. You can stop and look. When I was in Sri Lanka, Anomahamdra, the monk I was living with, he used to do that. He would go and stop at everyone's gate and just wait for a bit and see if they were going to give and then move on because nobody was used to giving. And so he felt like he had to do that. It's not very common. In, in Thailand, nobody does that. But that's what actually... Um, I think that's the the original way that it's explained. You know, to stop and look and then move on to the next house. But you can't make any noise that would bring your attention if you enter a village or something like that. Yeah, you can make noise. You don't have to be completely silent. Appasado, you have to be quiet. Appa means little noise. Appasado. I just recited those this afternoon. That mostly means That's don't talk loud. Bhante. Is that under specific conditions only, Bhante, or is that meant to be always? In the village. Apasado antaragarang. Antaragara means among houses. 
you should go, you should be quiet, don't talk loudly. There's a whole bunch of rules about what to do when you're in the village. Your eyes should look down, you shouldn't look around. You should look down at the ground, unless you have some reason to look around. I just want to ask, like, it, this is all for monks, but uh, like, it's kind of feeling like, should I be learning this? How to, uh, like, because behavior, it's useful still. You can, I can use it in my life as well. Well, when I found out I wouldn't be able to become a monk, I was really disappointed. And I just tried my best to be like a monk anyway. I went and bought a stainless steel mixing bowl and just put all my food in the mixing bowl. And I started learning all the monks, the way of the monk's life and tried to do as much as I could. So I certainly can live like a monk in many ways. Except for one of the most amazing things like going on alms. Right. But these relate to uh, more requisites, and of course, everybody has these as requisites, so they're easily adaptable to lay people as well. It's like con it's about contentment, being content with food that you get. Like if you're if someone makes you a meal or something, but not just um, not just saying to yourself, "I'm okay with this," but actually uh, being mindful when you eat and mindful so that you don't eat too much or that you don't eat the food that is the most delicious you instead think this is helpful for my body to keep me alive it's like medicine the buddha said food is alms food is like medicine you mix it up like medicine and eat it to cure the sickness of hunger to monks uh, from the monastery where you are living hunting or trampling do they still go on arms round? Yeah, apparently most monks do. I was surprised. I've only seen a few. But apparently most monks, someone said most monks. I'm st I still don't believe it, but I guess a lot of monks do. I've heard that some of them go a bit later, but I don't know where they all go because I only see a few when I go out. I've gone actually two big rounds and I've only seen you know, a handful of monks. So maybe they go a little later. So actually, one monk said they go a little earlier even. like Some of them are going earlier than I am, which is surprising. When I first started going, it was dark when I first went. But some of them go at 6 a.m. apparently. That would make sense why I never see them. Oh, Bhante, I thought you were intentionally going at the moment of sunrise, which was at 6.20. Until recently, it's getting earlier. Yeah, well, when I started, it was at 6.40 or something. Or I don't know about sunrise. There's dawn and then there's sunrise. Go with dawn. You're not supposed to go before dawn, which is like a half an hour before sunrise, I think. In the winter, dawn is late. Bhante, what does that refer to in terms of the experience of light during the day? Dawn. Like the sun has crossed the horizon? No, that's, that's uh, sunrise. Dawn is the first light. Okay. That's what I was trying to get at. Thank you. If you go before that, it's technically the day before, and you can't actually eat food or receive it. Well, you can receive it, but if you receive it, you can't. You can't if you receive it, you can't even eat it until dawn, and then eat it after dawn, because you've kept it overnight, and then it's not allowed. So going at six in the and technically it, it would be you wouldn't be able to use that food if you got food at six, not in the winter. And originally I chose six thirty just because it's six thirty, but and I changed my route, so I went five minutes early, thinking it was five minutes longer. Turns out it's actually not five minutes longer, but now I go at six twenty-five. I see. I see these like monks. Like I thought it's like organized that more monks go together. Basically, it's not just one by one or whenever whoever wants to go. There are monks here who go out in pair in pairs sometimes. That I, mean, I think there was a visiting monk who went with another monk, and I crossed paths with them while he was here. And now I just see the one monk alone. Uh, but there is another monastery nearby, and it looks like they all go together. I cross their paths sometimes, and it looks like they're going to specific places. Mm -hmm. Some monks have what they call regular patrons, and they go to their house every day. 
I think I have a bit of an advantage being a foreigner. There's kind of the novelty of it, I think, encourages some people to give food. It's also just if you have, how do I say, I guess merit is the word that everyone's familiar with. You have merit means you've accumulated, done a lot of good deeds in your past. You get more food. There was a monk in the time of the Buddha, Siwali was his name. And sometimes the monks would travel through places where there was no, nobody could get alms food and they were all starving. But when they went with Sivali, Sivali, somehow, no matter where they went, they always got more than enough food. So Sivali is kind of a good luck charm. Now they have statues of Sivali as a good luck charm. Because uh, wherever you won't go with Sivali, you, you will always get wealth or something. I don't know. But it's because I, he has I, such, good, such good merit. And there was another I monk just, who was a Sar Sari Buddha student. And Sari Buddha would go for alms and everyone would give him food. But then when this monk followed him, they got nothing. <laughs> he would go wherever they went. And all the people who normally would give him food just didn't give him food that way. That day. And so he said, okay, you wait in the monastery. I will go back. And he went back into the village. And suddenly everyone was like, oh, we didn't see you the first time. Where, where, are, where were you? And they gave him food. And he he took a bowl full of food and he had it sent back with a novice to give to that monk. And the novice ate it along the way. So he went back to the monastery and he said to this monk, did you get food yet? And he said, no, I haven't gotten any food. And so Sariputta took his own alms bowl and he hand fed this monk. That was the only way he could possibly eat. And he finally got one. It was the only meal he'd ever gotten. There's a longer story than that. He actually was never got enough food uh, since he was born. And it's because of uh, something he did in a past life. He threw alms food out that was to be given to an arahant because he was afraid the arahant would stay there. He was afraid this arahant would want to stay in, in a monastery if he, re if he saw the good food. And so... In the morning, when it was time to go for alms round, in, when it was time to ring the bell to go for alms, he would just took his fingernail and he just light, lightly touched the bell so that he could say he rang it. And we went into the village. They said, oh, where's that other monk who's visiting you? And he said, I don't know. I rang the bell and he didn't, he didn't show up. I guess he's sleeping. Maybe he's lazy. And they say, oh, well, here, take some food for him. But it was such good food, he was afraid that if he gave it to the Arahant, that the Arahant would want to stay there, so he threw it into the ditch. And the Arahant, realizing what was going on, thought, well, I'm not going to stay here, and he left. But that monk, when he passed away, he went to hell, I think, and then was reborn, and eventually was able to become a monk again in, in the time of this Buddha. I think it was Malukya, Malunkya his name was, not Malunkya Putta but I think his name was also Malunkia. This makes me wonder about the dilemma of the alms giver. If a, a line of monks or a group of monks were to come up, to whom, to whom do you offer the alms? Maybe you'd split it if you could split it, but otherwise you'd kind of hope the monks would split it on their own. Yeah, you usually just give it to the first monk. If you only have one thing, you give it to the first monk. But it's probably best to not go in large groups unless it's expected. On the other hand, if suppose you make a big pot of food, it's not that big of a deal to make one bag or three bags. You can make smaller portions, right? They give us big, big portions. They could split it in half and put it in two bags. In Sri Lanka, they don't use bags like that because they don't do alms around. It's something novel, but, so they just use like banana leaves or they'll just scoop it in. So if there's one monk or two monks, well, they just split it up. But in, in groups like that, they, they, when they get back to the monastery, they usually do just put it all in a, in a pile and split it up. And uh, sometimes they'll, they'll, they'll eat together. So if they got three different dishes or four different dishes, they put them in, in, in bowls and then they, each, they eat together. So they scoop some into their bowl of each one. So they each get a little bit of each other. This reminds me of the story of Venerable Sivali when the Buddha was going on arms round with Venerable Sivali. Uh, I think one uh, lay woman offered arms to the Buddha first, thinking that it was Venerable Sivali. Then later when she saw him, uh, she ran to the Buddha and took the 
arms for the she gave and put it back to when was he was uh, born right then people were the monks were upset about it or somebody was upset about it and the buddha said oh no it's good that they give to a good person something like that because when was he was there that in the foremost they uh, receiving gifts I also remember the story I want to say it when Pante was speaking about uh, Venerable Mahakasapa actually where uh, young people were carrying like a very delicious cake and they just passed by a group of monks including the Buddha and the monks are talking about oh these will not give us uh, any any arms with or anything and and then uh, the buddha said no they will get the kasapa and they did right that's when, what i was when... thinking so is it is it uh, because uh, they also gave uh, food maybe in the past and that's why they have that uh, very good karma or cause yeah that well, that can be a part of it for sure gave to gave alms food to the buddha gave alms food to arahants that's what sort of thing gave alms food to pacheka buddhas when i first came here to wat lampung i started giving my alms food to the monks i met i stopped doing it um i i, I was giving like anything extra i had i would i would find something that i could think of that they might like and when i met a monk on the road i would uh, ask to put food in his bowl and i would give him something and then i met this little novice and i tried to do that and he said oh i've got too much already <laughs> So then I wondered if I was really helping these monks by giving them extra food. I kind of stopped, but maybe I'll start again. It's also a little bit awkward because carrying and juggling and then finding the the thing to give to them and so on. But it's a thing where as a monk, you know, if you haven't been generous in the past, maybe you won't get uh, enough food yourself to eat. So it's a reminder that we have to be generous if you want if you want to receive generosity or even have the basic requisites to live you need to be generous in the first place yeah i mean sometimes i feel like it's it's so i i want to use the word magical actually like uh, since uh, i've been practicing and living like uh, with with the precepts and all that and ethically and so on it's just it's just so incredible how people treat uh, me even even just i'm i'm just a lay person but they how i give uh, food and and everything like it's just so incredible how karma actually really works for me it's also interesting that sometimes giving is not because i want to actually give just because it's a relief sometimes to not have things not because i want to get rid of it Yeah, it's a different practice to give your the things that you really want. Like if you go on alms round and give your best alms food away, I would do that for a while. I would give all my best stuff to Ajahn Tong. That was that was a real practice because some of it was oh I want to eat this. So oh, you look at that, you want to eat this, give that away. We have a cross coming two times a day to our house uh, to collect a uh, letter. So we really throw away. they come uh, early morning and in the afternoon to collect the food mm-hmm. so if we can't eat uh, you even sometimes i just give them biscuits and all we gave food to the squirrels in sri lanka and then there was a cat that was hanging around and it started eating the squirrels so yeah yeah sometimes squirrel when squirrels come at night to take the food uh, they get eaten by uh, owls and uh, eagles here there is a question in the chat from rizel uh, my question is if a monk dies what will happen with the body do they bury it or burn it no buddhists don't ever well in theravada buddhists don't ever bury the body as far as i know i can't think of any Theravada Buddhists that I've heard of ever bury, burying a body. I don't think any Buddhists do now that I think of it. It's always cremation. Burying is a Judeo-Christian thing, I think. It's also the yeah, ancient I... Egyptians, maybe. Do they keep the ashes? The Chinese, the Chinese emperors buried the bodies. 
Uh, they keep the ashes sometimes. Now, what they do do is they'll create a, a monument where they put the ashes. That's you'll see even in the monastery here. There, are, there are people who have their ashes in pillars and uh, in the walls of the monastery. I think there's people who have had their ashes interred. There's little plaques on the walls. Who would uh, cremate the monks? The community of monks, or the monastery, or their own family? Yeah, it would be the family would uh, sponsor it, but the monastery would run it. Well, I mean, if it was a monk who, even is, especially if he didn't have any family, then some one of his lay supporters would be the sponsor. That sort of thing, I guess. I, I don't actually know. It's a good question. No idea. Really. If you die there, then we sponsor <laughs> your cremation. Could do. I tell all my students if they die during meditation, I'll sponsor their uh, their funeral. It's a joke that Ajahn Tong used to tell. He said, "Don't worry, if you die, I'll do the chanting at your funeral for free." Were, were there a lot of students worried about dying during meditation or something? Well, not they don't not to that extent, but. When you say it, when you talk about dying, it puts everything in perspective. Like, what are you complaining about? It's not like you're going to die. So you just so instead of saying that, you say, "Don't worry if you die. I'll, I'll like you're not even concerned, even if it kills them." <laughs> uh, it's like, uh, why, why, why am I complaining about a little bit of pain? Okay, okay. Like if they're having trouble sit, sitting a long time and, and things like that. Yeah. Sometimes okay. they say this weird thing happened in their body and they're not sure what it means, if it's, a, if it's dangerous or something. And you say, oh, don't worry if you die. I'll be your sponsor for your funeral. And how about when uh, students worry about uh, them going crazy like because they are experiencing weird things during practice? Well, you have to be clear with them. Are they practicing mindfulness? Meditation can, if you're not really mindful, drive you crazy. But we're careful about, or I'm careful anytime a meditator starts saying, like they they want to feel peaceful, and so they say peaceful, peaceful. Or they want to be patient, so they say patient, patient, that sort of thing. I'm quick to tell them that is absolutely not how we practice. I mean, try not to scare them. I don't, don't say it quite like that, but... Just be clear, look, that's not mindfulness. You have to be clear that that is not how we practice here. All right, that's all for me. Have a good week, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Bhante. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good week. Thank you. Enjoy your week.